Last year, I did a video on the vocal chain I'd been using for doing live sound, and today I thought I would walk you through what do I do in the studio when I'm mixing here. The goal of what I'm trying to do with the vocal is often kind of the same as what I do in live sound, but the sources, they can be much more varied. You know, there's everything from studio recordings that come into me that have been EQ'd and compressed on the way in when they were tracked. Then there's other recordings I get from artists and producers where maybe it was recorded in a studio with a good mic, maybe a mid-level microphone. Sometimes there might be compression. Sometimes there might be EQ. A lot of times there is none of that. Sometimes I'm dealing with live recordings that maybe I made or that somebody else did and they're getting sent to me. And in those cases, a lot of times it is just a live vocal mic into a preamp and then straight to recording. So lots of different scenarios that I potentially deal with. So I'm just going to kind of show you this is the chain that I usually start with for lead vocals or just generic vocals in general. I'll, I'll start with those. I have a track preset that I load onto vocal tracks when I'm getting ready to mix. And all it does is it has a certain set of inserts on there, which is basically my chain. And this is what it looks like when I load it. You can see there is a lot of stuff that is disabled to begin with. Because in general, I'm trying to do the least amount of processing to anything that I can. I just find in general, the less you do to things, the better they sound. Now, that doesn't mean I'm afraid to use things because I will use whatever is needed to get the job done but I always try and start with a minimalist approach. And first thing in my chain is EQ, very similar to doing live sound. This is what that EQ looks like. It's just a, a high pass filter on there to begin with, kind of steep, what is that, 18 dB per octave. And a lot of times this gets brought up probably a lot higher than you would think. And it just depends on the vocal, so EQ. Next in my chain is Soothe 2, which sometimes I use and sometimes I don't. When I do turn it on, it looks something like this, and I never leave it static in these settings. I always adjust things. I always adjust the depth. I always adjust the frequency points that it's looking at. I dial it in every time. So I think this is just a default preset and I leave it there because I know I'm going to tweak it a ton. Next up is a little bit of auto-tune. This doesn't get used when I have tracks that come into me that were already produced and tuned, which in most cases they should be. Every once in a while though, I will get a vocal in that needs a little bit of love and this is usually the first thing I try. And if this doesn't solve things for me, it usually means I'm going to go into Melodyne and I'm going to manually adjust any pitchiness that seems off or that an artist is asking me to change. Next up after that is the SSL2 EV channel. This, I really don't use this as much on vocals anymore. Typically, if I'm using this, I'm not going to use the Pro-Q3 for an EQ, and this is just going to be my EQ that I use. But lately, I've just been doing everything with the Pro-Q3. Sometimes I like using this on vocals and really anything in general because I can't see the curve. And if I feel like I'm having a hard time getting something dialed in. Sometimes it is easier for me to just go to this and then really just kind of turn knobs until it sounds good. I mean, in general, that's usually the best approach for just about anything. But this is one of those things. It's it's a head thing. And, and I, I like the way the EV2 sounds and the way it works. I really love the high shelf on the SSL channels. So... 
a lot of times I will just lean on this for that, but only if I'm not using the Pro-Q3. It's usually one or the other, and most of the time these days, I'm using the Pro-Q3. All right, next up is the first of all of the compressors that I have on here, and this is the Amec Mastering Compressor. This is modeled on a compressor that was not made by Amec, and that was not a mastering compressor. I mean, I guess you could use it for that, but this was actually modeled off of a GML compressor. And if you go and watch some videos on that, that's gonna be the best thing to kind of show you what this thing can do on vocals. And this is what it's set at when I bring it up and Generally, all I'm adjusting is the threshold, maybe the timing a little bit. Sometimes I will adjust the ratio. It's pretty low at 2.2 to 1. This compressor is what, in my mind, is my tracking compressor. It is not working hard. I'm just using this to do sort of some general leveling of the vocal, and it just works really good at that. It is pretty transparent. Now, I hesitate to even call this a compressor. It's definitely something that has very different controls, probably, from what you might be used to. Some of it is similar, but this is kind of a different beast and a different animal. And I don't even think that the GML unit, they referred to it as a compressor. I think it was a dynamic range controller. So that's really what I'm using it for, is kind of transparent leveling just kind of my basic, it's like a tracking compressor for me. It's just to kind of get things a lot more balanced. When I have live vocals, a lot of the time where the dynamic range is just ginormous, this thing is awesome for me for kind of getting it a lot tighter before I can actually start doing some compression to it. Next in my chain is kind of my main vocal compressor. These days, I'm using this Pulsar 1178 a lot. In the past, I've used the Wave CLA 76. In general, this is some kind of 1176 style of compressor. I might use the Arouser here every once in a while, but it's, it's typically this 1178 right now. If this doesn't feel right to me, like maybe sometimes it might feel a little too aggressive for me, maybe a little too forward, because I, I hit this hard. Like I'm not, I'm not Tom Lord Algae banging the, the needle all the way over, but this is definitely in that seven to 10 or maybe even a little more range as to how hard I work it. Sometimes that feels like too much. So, when this feels a little too aggressive, a lot of times I will swap it out for something like maybe a CLA-3A or a CLA-2A. So think some kind of optical compressor, maybe an LA-2A, LA-3A style of compressor. So compression. Next up is Arvox. I don't use this as much for compression anymore, although with some styles of music, if I really feel like it needs to get pinned, sometimes I will do a little more compression in this on top of the 1178 and even on top of that AMAC. Now, going back, I should mention something. With all three of these compressors, I don't always use them all. Sometimes when things are coming into me, if they have already been compressed, I'm turning some of these off. I might only end up using the 1178, or I might only end up using the AMAC, or I might only end up using an LA-2A or something like that. It just depends on what's coming in. Right now, this is kind of like a worst case scenario where nothing has been done to the vocal ahead of time. So in that case, I'm going to lean a lot more on these compressors. But it's also sort of genre specific. And I'm not always just hammering and crushing things with compression. I know a lot of guys maybe default to doing that. And then there's probably some engineers who kind of default to the other extreme. I am 
all over the place. It just depends on the song. It depends on the artists and what they're going for. Now, this Arvox that's in here, sometimes I will do a little compression with it, but more often what I'm using this for is the gate feature in here. And the gate that's in here, I use this gate live, basically. It's similar to the gate that's in max volume, which is similar to the gate that is in the new Silk Vocal plugin. It's just a soft, gentle gate. I'll use that gate sometimes to clean up in between verses and phrases and things like that. Sometimes this gate can also be real helpful if I have somebody who is breathing really hard in between phrases. Sometimes that gate can help kind of bring some of that down. Sometimes, though, I just have to manually go in and clean things up. The nice thing about this plugin, though, is it takes me 15 seconds to figure out, is it going to work or not? And when it works, it works great. And when it doesn't, I just go in and manually do it, which takes more time. But if I can figure out whether I actually need to do that really fast, I lean on this to do it. All right, next up would be a de -esser. Not everything needs de -essing. This is still my favorite de in the world. I try new de all the time, and none of them do for me what this one does. So, Massey de -esser. In general, these settings, this is my start. What I just do is I use the wet-dry, and I use that to de -ess. And to me, that is really transparent and is the best way to do de-essing. Sometimes for de-essing, I use Soothe a little more. Soothe can do really good as a de -esser, but when I'm not using Soothe, I'll use the Massey. Sometimes I use them both. It just depends, again, on the vocal. Sometimes if the S's are really bad, I will take it into RX and I will use the spectral, uh, spectral processing in there to clean things up if I need to. After that, I have an F6 in here. I honestly rarely use this anymore. And I love this plugin, but when I need dynamic EQ, most of the time I will lean on the Pro-Q3. One of the things about the Pro-Q3 that I like is it's a different kind of threshold mechanism in the dynamic EQ. It's not just based on the incoming level. I believe, and I could be wrong on this, but I believe it is looking at the balance of that filter relative to everything else in the signal. So since it's not threshold based the same way, it doesn't matter to me as much where in the signal chain I use it. So a lot of times I'll just use the dynamic EQ in the Pro-Q3. Now, if there is something that is happening that I need to fix because, you know, the compression that I put on it has made something worse and I can't fix it there, I will just about always lean on this F6. I'll open it up and look at it. But I'm starting to get to a point where I might take that out of my chain here in the studio because I'm just not using it as much as I used to. I still love it though. Fantastic plugin. It is a big part of my live sound mixing these days for sure. Just in here between the Pro-Q3 and Soothe, that stuff usually works a little better for me. Something I am starting to experiment with is the new plugin from Oak Sound Bloom. That might end up in my chain here, but I'm not quite sure I want to use that on vocals yet. I'm still figuring that out. Last thing in my chain is this Mog EQ4. I use this for one thing, and it's the air band. I have it set at 20 hertz to start with, and then I just add gain to taste if I'm really trying to bring up the top end on it. The air band on this is fantastic. I mean, everything else in here, it's a great EQ. I just tend to really lean on it for the air band. I should probably figure out what the, the shape of that filter is at 20 hertz and just build a filter in Pro-Q3 to use it. But at the same time, though, I feel like having this last in the chain does something different than if I had it earlier. So this is kind of a last little bit of polish. Sometimes I'll use 
some of these other bands in here, but I mean, mainly it's, it's all about the air band. There's actually a two band version of this plugin out right now. If that had been out when I bought this, I would have just bought that because I think the two band version has the, the air band in it. And since that's all I'm using, I could get away with that, but I don't have that one. I have this one. So I use that for the air band. So that's my lead vocal chain and kind of my generic vocal chain. When I start getting into lots of background vocals and stacks of background vocals, I have a different chain a lot of times that I put on background vocals. Lately, one of the things I've been doing with backgrounds like that is I've been using stereo routing folders. It is just a lot easier for me to keep the left and the right balance right. And especially as I start panning things in Atmos, it makes a big difference for me to kind of have that control when I need it. But then I just do my processing right on this, uh, this folder. First thing in the chain again, Pro Q3. The high pass on here starts a little higher than it does on my kind of generic vocals. And again, this is something I'm not afraid to crank higher. Next after that is an instance of Sooth 2. Again, just like on the kind of normal vocals. Sometimes I use it, a lot of times I don't. Next in the chain is something that's newer for me that I picked up in the last year. This is the Mixland Vac Attack from Plugin Alliance. It's based on an old VAC rack compressor. I started using this, I'll just be honest. I started trying this out on background vocals because I know that it is Chris Lord Algae's go-to background vocal compressor, and I understand why now. I don't know how close this gets to what the actual hardware was like, but it is working for me and what I'm trying to use it for. And I have the uh, the reduction setting. It is at the CLA setting, basically. It's just, it's on stun. And it's been working great for me. So I just, I just leave it there. Sometimes I will use these EQ knobs down here because these work really good. And sometimes I might, I might drive the THD a little harder, but in general, I don't feel like I need to touch this most of the time. If the gain staging going into it is right, it just kind of works. And I mean, I, it looks like it's doing a ton and <laughs> maybe it is, but on background vocals, it works really good. And you know, the thing with the dynamics of background vocals is a lot of times I find it is better to have them less dynamic, like very much less dynamic than your leads, because then they kind of will sit behind the lead. And, you know, you have this pinned kind of leveled background vocal. It doesn't work for every genre. doesn't work for every mix, of course. But when you've got that kind of pinned, if you have that lead that's maybe a little more dynamic, it can sit a little bit above it and it just feels a lot better. You don't have this background vocal that will potentially poke out above the lead ever. It just kind of stays limited, basically, so that the lead vocal can maintain the focus. So Mixland Vac Attack, very cool plugin. Other plugin I've been using lately from Mixland is the rubber band compressor. I really like that, but I use that for something different. Just got to give a shout out to the Mixland guys because they're doing some cool stuff, I think. Next up in my chain after that stuff is, again, I've got another Arvox. I don't really use the compressor on this again. I'm just using the gate because that gate is great for cleaning stuff up and with a lot of the background vocals that have been coming into me lately, they just haven't been edited that well. And there can be a lot of cleanup that still needs to happen. Again, this can let me know very quickly, is this going to work and just clean it up? Otherwise, I'll go in and manually do it. So I still do a lot of manual cleanup work on vocals because there are lots of clicks and pops I find. And when you start breaking that out into Atmos and you start spreading lots of vocal stacks around, if the editing 
was kind of sloppy, it really sticks out. So I do still end up doing a lot of manually editing of background vocals because just the the edits aren't clean and there'll be clicks and pops and you'll hear them cutting in and out. And this is a tool that helps deal with that, but this is on top of a lot of times, a lot of manual editing. Last in the chain on the background vocals is a de If I need to de them, I put that on there. A general rule of thumb for me is there usually only needs to be one S. So a lot of times I DS backgrounds really hard, but it's case by case. If I turn on Soothe, a lot of times Soothe is taking care of that for me too. But it's just case by case. As I said, depends on the song, depends on the mix. So those are my vocal chains in the studio right now. I'm sure they will change within the next year because I'm always changing things up. Sorry, I don't have any sound examples on these. It's hard to to show it because every vocal is different. I could show it on one vocal and it would be completely different on another one. So for me, easier to talk about these. You can try some of these out for yourself. What's your vocal chain, though? What are the things you like on vocals? Because I'm always looking for new things to do on vocals. Please leave a comment below and let me know what you like on vocals these days so that I can go try some new things and maybe see about changing things up. So thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.